Welcome to the Stimulation Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler West, and today I'm here with Sam Kazayam. How are you doing, Sam? Not too bad. Thanks for having me on, Tyler. Yeah, okay. So, why don't you give a brief introduction for yourself? Absolutely. As mentioned earlier, I'm Sam Kazayam. I'm uh, one of the content creators here on Stimulation, and I'm going to uh, McMaster for uh, engineering in the fall. I'm a fellowship leader. Uh, I'm heavily involved in things uh, like FRC back in high school. I was the uh, owner of, operator of a couple of startups, like my own tutoring business and uh, Ecological, part of a JA company. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very passionate about those kind of things. Very interesting, dude. That's for sure. Um, so today, Sam, you've been doing some research into the recent Twitter scandal. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. hack that, uh, as, as some people put it, put it the the biggest hack in Twitter's history at, at this point. Okay, wow. Okay, so why don't you give us a brief rundown of, of what happened and, and then we can go from there. Absolutely. So uh, first off, some general info. The hack occurred Wednesday, July 15th, so just about three weeks ago. Uh, this is 2020. Uh, and as, as of this date, uh, August 4th, the suspected masterminds have been caught. Uh, hackers ha- the, the hackers accessed accounts of prominent figures such as Obama, uh, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, uh, Kanye West, Apple, and many other accounts. Uh, in, specifically, there were 130 accounts accessed, uh, 45 accounts that were tweeted from. Uh, they were able to get DM access from 36 accounts, including one, I believe it was a, an elected official in the Netherlands, so quite high pro- they could have gotten access to quite high pro- profile people. And they actually downloaded all the Twitter data from up to eight. I'm getting seven users, which is quite scary. Now, the whole premise of the hack or scam, I suppose, is what they did is they went onto these high pro- profile accounts and tweeted them out a message just like this. So I'm reading it directly from the account that was, uh, or the tweet that was posted from Jeff Bezos' account. It says, I've decided to give back to my community. All Bitcoin sent to my address below will be sent back doubled. I'm only doing a maximum of $50 million. And then it shows a Bitcoin address that you can send uh, Bitcoin to and enjoy. So uh, an interesting demographic of, demographic of people because these people have to be smart enough to know how to use Bitcoin, which not a lot of people do. And somehow also not smart enough to realize that this is an obvious scam. Yeah. I wonder if anyone actually uh, ended up in going through and sending the Bitcoin. Did you, did you read anything about that or did you see anything about that? The hackers actually earned uh, nearly $120,000 in this scam, which is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and just to note on how sloppy the hackers were, like in each of the tweets that were sent out from all the companies, the same Bitcoin address was linked on that tweet. So if you look at each tweet, you can see, oh, wait, these two are the same. Either Apple and, and uh, Kanye West and Elon Musk and Bill Gates are all collaborating on this uh, thing together, or this is one guy trying to make an attempt at uh, like an obvious mass scam. You'd think they'd be a little smarter than that, eh? Might have a multiple Bitcoin addresses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they did this. To, did they do it all at the same time? Like, were all the, did all the tweets happen right around the same time, or was it like sporadic throughout the day, or how did it go? Yeah, so it was it was basically they did it all at once. From what I understand, I might be incorrect on this, but I believe that Elon Musk's account was the first to be targeted, and then they just uh, did as many as they could in a in a short amount of time. Uh, and Twitter, as soon as they realized, oh wow, a scam's going on, uh, what they did first is uh, at around six p.m. EST. Uh, they prevented uh, the verified accounts from tweeting and then posted updates over the next several couple of hours stating that uh, the ability to uh, to tweet or to change passwords or anything like that would be restricted for certain users just as they're trying to figure this all out. Um, in the end, as they claim, it, it, uh, it's, it should be all fixed now, but I think this is the first time in Twitter history that they've actually uh, gotten this close to shutting down the entire platform for a scam. Oh, wow. That's Mm kind of crazy. So if they're that close to shutting down the entire platform, how did this person manage to actually, or this group of people, not sure, um, manage, manage to do this? 
That's an excellent question. We'll get to actually who did it later. So we'll start into how they did it. So in an official statement released by the Twitter account, uh, they stated kind of vaguely that it was uh, from a, uh, a social engineering attack. So it was a, a spear phishing uh, attack. Now, social engineering is, it's basically the art of scamming. So picking up the phone and saying, hello, I'm an important person from company X, and I need your administrative credentials to access this website. Could you please give them to me? Obviously not that simple, but something along those lines. Yep. And just as a precursor to how these events may have been possible, uh, as uh, the listeners may know, and for people who are watching in the future, uh, we are currently going through the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, which means that everyone is working at home, uh, including employees. And so if, if the employees are all working from home, and uh, if they can act, if people from all over the world can access uh, Twitter's systems, which that they admitted in their statement. They said that they, they have uh, technical teams from all over the world. It becomes much more difficult to ensure that all users are using secure lines from authorized devices, for example. If you're in person, it's much easier to, auth to um, authenticate someone by looking at their face and say, hey, I know you, you are a fellow Twitter employee and I trust you. However, when you're working at home, you're more likely to use unprotected devices. You're more likely to trust people that you don't need you can't, well, because you can't look at their face, you're more likely to trust them just by their voice. And that leads to a lot more, you know, open vulnerabilities by people. Okay, so let's start with how they did this. So first thing was getting some recon. They targeted specific employees using sites like LinkedIn. They just did a lot of data mining to find out all the information that was out there on, uh, that they could about the person. So phone numbers, what department they were employed in, and they used uh, the recruiter tools on LinkedIn, for example, to get access to, uh, to information that, for example, regular users wouldn't have access to. And what they did is they, once they had enough information, they contacted them, uh, gained their trust, and asked to take them to a phishing website. Now, uh, do, you know who, do you know what exactly phishing is? That's where you have a website that looks like a real website, but in fact, it is a fake website, right? Exactly. And draw I'm ashamed. Sorry? It's meant to draw information and that sort of thing. Exactly. I'm ashamed to say that I'm, I was actually the victim of a phishing account from my Facebook uh, account really? wow. like one or two years back. Just, I, it was, it was, I, I just woke up. I was going on autopilot, turned on my phone, saw a trusted friend sent me a message. I clicked on it and just like, I don't know what was up. I just typed in the information and uh, the same link got uh, DM to all of my contacts. So personally now I'm, I'm very, I'm much more cautious about uh, what I do to the listeners out, out there, make sure that you check your, uh, the URL to whenever you access a login information, because a lot of the times, if you look at the URL, it's quite evident that it is a, a phony one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I remember that attack that you're talking about. Cause I remember like getting just, there was a ton of people who happened to just spam me with this thing. And once you click the link, it spammed everybody that you knew. Yep. I think, I think I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully nothing to, uh, too malicious, but definitely annoying. Definitely something to keep tra to keep watch mm -hmm. of, especially if you're uh, more high profile of a person. Yeah. For low profile profile people, especially like us, it's it's nice that we don't have to worry about it, but at the same time, we still have to keep our caution. Absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, hackers got access to the Twitter's administrative administrative tools uh, by using a, tw a fake Twitter VPN, and uh, so yeah, same process. They called them, said, said, hey, I need access to your information. Can you log into this uh, in this link? They click on the link, enter the information, and it gets sent right to their, uh, right to, right to their database. They, they can access right away. Now, the big problem with this plan is multi-factor authentication, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when you type, a, type something on your, on your computer for, from, let's say, you try to access your Google account from work, some, ac some uh, accounts will say, oh, you are accessing this from a different location. And it will do a little prompt on your phone saying, hey, we have noticed a Google sign in from this IP address in this location. Please confirm that it is you by, by, by hitting yes. Mm -hmm. Now to, to bypass that, what the hackers were actually doing is while the user was inputting, while the employee was inputting their information in real time, they were taking that and putting that into the real Twitter VPN right away. And okay. so when, when they hit enter, just uh, that sent the prompt to the employee's phone. Ba 
functionally almost immediately after she had typed in the information to the fake website or she or he, I don't know who it was. Sorry. Wow. That so like they were, they were doing it like was, and they were doing that manually or was that like a robot that was doing it for them? Or I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, okay. But, but yeah, but in, in, it was, that real was the time, plan. Yeah. So they, so they managed to get them basically. Yep. And so employee didn't know the, was, was none the wiser click the, I verify on my account. If it was a pin they had to access, they put that pin into the fake, the fake website, immediately transferred into the, uh, into, the, into the hands of the hackers, and they put that right into the real database or into the real website. Yeah. Um, and now the thing about that is that the, the employee that they had did not necessarily had, have access to the administrative tool of Twitter that could access such high profile accounts. However, the, the account that they got access to allowed them to find information on the employees uh, who, uh, who had that information. And then it would just be a, a wash, rinse, repeat kind of thing where they'd do the same thing again with a higher profile individual. Okay, so it was like, a, it took a little while then, a couple stepping stones to reach the information that they needed to get to kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Persistent guys, and I think that's what we really have to do when you're hacking. <laughs> Not that I'm endorsing it, but like you really have to be persistent in order to do something like this. Yeah, absolutely. So who is the actual person that, that did it then? Did they, have they found them yet? I think you mentioned that they did, right? Yep. So before I get into it, I just want to, I, I just want to mention that this hacking scheme is certainly sophisticated, right? It, it, it requires a lot of knowledge. It requires a lot of recon information, but it doesn't require too, too much technical expertise, right? Like the fact that to us, uh, to basically laymen on the subject are able to talk about this right now and understand what's going on shows that a lot of, that most people can understand the mechanism of attack, right? Yep. So, so with that in mind, let's talk about the people involved. On Friday, July 31st, 2020, so just, uh, just past Friday for people watching this, uh, authorities such as the FBI, IRS, the U.S. Secret Service, and the Florida Law Enforcement Agency charged three people involved in this incident. The first one is a 22-year-old UK resident called, named uh, Nima Fazeli. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Another uh, person affiliated was 19-year-old Florida resident Mason Shepard. And get this. Here's the mastermind of this whole operation. Can you guess how old he was? Probably like 12 or something, by the way. You're leading into it or something <laughs> crazy. Not far off. 17 years old, my age. Yeah. Uh, Graham Clark, 17-year-old Florida resident, charged for 30 counts of felony as an adult, not as a juvenile, because this is just such a crazy uh, charge. That, and I believe the Florida law agency does have the, uh, the authority to do that. Now, let's talk a little bit about how, a little bit, I'm not going to get into too many details uh, on how exactly they were caught. Mm -hmm. But specifically, what, uh, how it happened was that the hackers were identified by a database that was... Uh, you know, that was stolen by a group of rival hackers and then leaked uh, and published to, for example, the FBI. Uh, and that, that forum contained certain clues of the information of Fazeli and Shepard. Uh, specifically, an, an, on that database, an anonymous user posted that he would, for example, buy a compromised video game account in last February using a Bitcoin address that could be tied to the address that was used in the July 15 hack. So basically, Bitcoin uses something called a cluster to uh to kind of tie those accounts back to one specific wallet okay sorry not those the, accounts those addresses to one wallet so you can link the bitcoin they could link the bitcoin account back to a purchase with the other bitcoin account is that sort of what yeah okay yep and so and then there as a result of that now they had the person who they thought they did it and now they needed personal information on that person uh and long story short that post on that form led them to discovering another account uh, that was on the same database, which actually had an email address tied to uh, that account. And okay. using that email address, the authorities were able to tie that back to Shepard, which I'm assuming got them to hot on the trail of Clark and Fazeli as well. Damn. So yeah, sloppy stuff. Uh, they, they definitely were, uh, they're not super experienced in this. Uh, and, you know, especially by the fact that the, they weren't very creative in how they, they got the money. You could like just tweeting out a very obvious scam. It's uh, with, with that amount of power they had in their hands, they could have got a lot more benefit out of it. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Anyway, they didn't. that's uh, that, exactly. That's, yeah. that's what we're going to talk about a bit later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, this is a, a crazy hack. So I guess sort of you kind of started a bit into it a bit, but what, what's your take? Like what's your, what's your overall opinion on the matter, I guess. Absolutely. So obviously this is a massive, massive failure on Twitter's end. Uh, now I understand that uh, if, if, one employee is comp uh, compromised the account. Okay, that happens. Stuff like that will happen in a tech company. It sucks to say, but it does. However, the thing is that if you're if you can exploit human weaknesses and get into the system, there should be certain system safeguards that are able to not that are able to uh, to stop you from getting any further. And as I mentioned earlier, the Obviously, a lot of the safeguards were not as highly, uh, not as reinforced due to the COVID COVID nineteen pandemic and everyone working at home. But even still, if even just by the nature of your system, one human leader, one human vulnerability can lead to an entire system vulnerability. That's a problem with the system, not just the human. True. Um, and the thing is that um, this is not the first time that. Uh, something has happened within the company that uh, led to an account being compromised. For example, in, in 2017, an incident occurred with a, a Twitter employee who was on his last day uh, and Donald Trump's Twitter account. Now, I won't say anything about the guy, but uh, uh, what they did to, to stop this from happening again is that they added extra precautions on his account uh, uh, by Twitter. So Twitter okay. actually safeguarded his account more so that that administrative tool that was used to access all the high profile accounts was probably, we don't, again, Twitter's not very transparent with us on this, but it was probably not used to, or it could not be used uh, with the information they had to access Trump's account, which is probably why Trump was not targeted in the attack. Okay. So it's like a, the slowly evolving process over time where get hacked, fix it, get hacked, make it better, get hacked, make it better again kind of thing. Maybe, but you, even still, this happened in 2017. And if they were able to put uh, those kind of precautions on Trump's account, why not all, on all the accounts that were so high profile? Why not on Musk? Why not on Biden's? Why not on Obama's? True. All these people, who, all these high profile figures who have the, you know, the authority to say things. And if it's believable enough, people will panic if, it's, if the subject is, uh, like, for example, what if uh, Biden, one of the current... Uh, Run it, uh, people who are, who's running the 2020 candidacy just came an account came on his feed saying uh, this statement is from the official Biden campaign. Biden has been pronounced dead. That would be chaotic, even for just a certain a few hours. That would throw the like that would the world the entire yeah. world in chaos. Yeah, true. You, you could control stocks with that power. Like if you if you if you say for example test uh, if you treat me on Musk account, I'm resigning from Tesla. Stocks would plummet there. You could yeah. you there's so much damage you can do with that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we have to understand that Twitter is such an influential platform for the dissemination of, uh, of uh, information regarding policy and political discussion, right? Like, obviously, coming back to Trump, uh, a lot of the things, a lot of his personal opinions are voiced through Twitter. And I think it's the same thing with many other high profile people. And I think it should be that Twitter should be treated that way by the company, treated as a very, very influential platform. Uh, and if a 17 year old boy with only two people who are helping him out was able to do that much damage in that short time, how much more damage will an organization with multiple teams of experienced hackers, how, how, what would they do? Uh, to not make the same mistakes they would do and like actually get in, be unnoticed and, and plant uh, much more devastating uh, bugs or much more devastating hacks that could deal much damage to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to global economies, if used correctly, incorrectly, I should say. <laughs> very true. And so, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just very, very true. That's all I was saying. Absolutely. That, that could mm. be um, a lot of, damage done very quickly if uh, a larger hack or a larger mm -hmm. organization um, was able to attack them. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, I think you mentioned this, that it's the silver lining about this whole situation is that at least this was, this hack was not used for much more malicious behavior. Out of the stuff they could have done, 
they chose to do very little. And as much as scummy and as terrible as it is that this happened, at least that it, uh, it, it did not do any apparent lasting damage, as we know. And now it's brought the security issues of Twitter into the public eye and into the, the corporation of Twitter's eye as well. And uh, that would hopefully allow them to, to quickly implement some safeguards now uh, that will at least patch some of these vulnerabilities that are, as we saw in the, in the past events, so blatantly exploited or exploitable in this system. Mm -hmm. This all comes in like the wake of what's happening right now um, with the U.S. regulation on like very large companies. Um, like last week, all the big CEOs, I think it was Amazon, Facebook. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other two were here. Uh, I, I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. But there was very large CEOs, and they had them all testifying there. And a lot of it was along the lines of political bias. Oh, Google was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, then, you're right. I can't remember the fourth one. But they, they, a lot of it was along the lines of political bias and how those companies are able to control information and control things like that. So I think it's um, very similarly in the vein of this where. Twitter has a responsibility to uphold um, like the truth and, and not being hacked in that way, just as Facebook would, or um, even Amazon too. Like they all have a very important responsibility in making sure that their security systems are up to date. And I imagine they are taking very strict um, measures to, to see that happen. But yeah, you throw a little disarray with COVID-19, have some home-based employees for a little while, and then everything kind of just falls apart. Um, well, not completely, but enough that they're able to access 30-something high-profile accounts and do some pretty significant damage. So, yeah, that was uh, pretty – it shows you what happens when, the, when we don't think all the way outside the box sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precisely. And, you know, a, a lot of this comes down to identifying the threats before they happen. And that's why, you know, that's why white hat hackers exist, to, to actually – go in and try to exploit vulnerabilities of the system as hired by the company, uh, for example, Twitter. Mm -hmm. They go in, find the bugs, and, uh, and then they can report them to, to the organization that they can patch them. That's, I think, uh, what happened to the Equifax scandal back, uh, or Equifax hack back, I think, two years ago or so, where the bug that caused the attack was, uh, was given to the company a little earlier, I think a couple months back. However, they didn't uh, do enough in time to stop the vulnerability from taking place. And that led to the dissemination of and uh, um, vulnerability of many different accounts in the Equifax. And, and, you're, and you're right that uh, we really do have to keep uh, these corporations accountable as, as users ourselves, uh, that our information is safe. I, I, and as I said earlier, us as low, pro, low profile users, we're lucky enough that it's not as, uh, we're not as susceptible to major breaches. Mm -hmm. However, I'm sure we are all aware of the catastrophic things that could happen if these, if these powers fell in the wrong hands. And, uh, you know, uh, e even for us users, if just, just, just a note for us, we should be very careful with what we put out on online. That, that's one thing we learned here. Like, for example, if the data on the Twitter, uh, on the Twitter employees was uh, not put out on LinkedIn for the public to see, it may have been much harder for the, for the hackers to access it and carry out the attack. So just be very careful on what you put online. And the second kind of key takeaway, I think, that we should take from this experience is that, as we said earlier, we must keep these organizations accountable. Like, for example, Jack Dorsey, who's the current, C uh, who's the current CEO of Twitter, is only part-time. And I think that with such a, a large organization, something that is so influential, I think that he should, really should commit more time to it, to organizing the project and making sure that things like this don't happen again. And as much as I hate to say it, that I, I think that it's important that in order to hold people accountable to this, certain high profile people, if this continues to happen, should, for example, uh, as, as, we, as kind of crazy as Bibi, as it would be, we kind of, they have to say like, I'd have to move away from Twitter if this keeps happening because I don't feel secure here. I, I, th I think that if the security measures are, are, uh, are, not, are not going to be changed, if they're not going to be updated, then it could lead to far worse things. And, you know, hopefully that leads to the implementation of better cyber, cybersecurity networks. And especially in a time, as you mentioned earlier, where everybody is working from home, 
and otherwise, uh, and that could prevent a lot more damage from being possible. I think that's kind of the optimistic outlook, which we should all be striving for there. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. Personally, I think I'd trust Twitter more than Facebook at the current moment. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, thanks for coming on today, Sam. Any final thoughts before we go? Or are you good with those takeaways? No, I think, uh, yeah, just everyone out there, stay safe with, you, with what you do online. It's a, it's a crazy place out there. And as we work, it's, you know, it's an arms race between the hackers and the organizations to make sure that the hackers have their tools and then the organizations patch those tools as well. So just as, as people in the middle of this, stay safe. Stay very cautious about you post online. Awesome. All right. Thank you. This has been the Stimulation Podcast. Episode three, how to stop yourself from being hacked and all about the Twitter scandal. Awesome.